morning, I'm Paul Hunter, and this is The National. Chaos in Trump's court. If Lawrence wants to explain that he's not a leaker, let him do that. And as the U.S. president courts more chaos, warnings now from Republicans. Any effort to go after Mueller could be the beginning of the end of the Trump presidency. Shaken confidence as indigenous leaders take aim at the inquiry into the missing and the murdered. New questions about old medicine. I think the antibiotic course over time is getting shorter and shorter, and that's a good thing. And taking lives, taking livelihoods. The insurers have pretty much just shut the door on us, uh, saying that they won't even look at it because it's terrorism and therefore we're not covered. Has the time come for terrorism insurance? Raging tweets, open threats, profanity-laced quotes on the record. Rarely, if ever, have Washington power struggles been waged like they are now, out in the open. One member of the Trump administration gunning for another, the U.S. president laying siege to his own attorney general. And now, Republicans moving to wall Trump in, afraid of what he might do next. The details now from Lindsey Duncombe. He was supposed to turn things around, bring a sense of order to Donald Trump's White House. But less than a week in, Director of Communications Anthony Scaramucci is in what feels like an in-the-gutter style power struggle with long-rumored rival White House Chief of Staff Reince Priebus. And it's unfolding live on cable TV. Scaramucci phoned into CNN this morning complaining about leaks. Absolutely, completely and totally reprehensible. And the, as you know from the Italian expression, the fish stinks from the head down. Scaramucci appeared to blame Priebus for the leaks on Twitter. Any attempt to back away from the rivalry was overshadowed by the details of a conversation a New Yorker reporter said Scaramucci had with him, posted online tonight. He called Priebus a paranoid schizophrenic who would resign very shortly. Scaramucci said he wanted to effing kill all the leakers. The reporter read the profanity-rich quotes on CNN. Putting Anthony Scaramucci in that job was like throwing a grenade into an ongoing civil war. And there's another battle for White House survival. The president's attacks on his own attorney general have been intensifying. Today, Jeff Sessions admitted to Fox News. It's kind of hurtful, but the president of the United States is a strong leader. There are moves from within Trump's own party to curb that strength. The concern? That Trump would fire Sessions and replace him with an attorney general who would then fire Robert Mueller, the special investigator looking into links between the Trump campaign and Russia. If Jeff Sessions is fired, there will be holy hell to pay. Uh, any effort to go after Mueller could be the beginning of the end of the Trump presidency. To prevent that from happening, senators drafted legislation to curb the president's power to fire a special counsel. The presidency isn't a bull, and this country isn't a china shop. Mr. President, you're a public servant in a system of limited government with a duty to uphold and to defend and to teach to our kids the Constitution system of checks and balances. What isn't clear is if this is all because of circumstance or by design. Remember, Donald Trump was the chaos candidate threatening to shake up Washington. This town is rattled. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. The head of the American Boy Scouts has apologized today for a highly political speech Donald Trump gave to thousands of young people at the organization's annual National Jamboree. Today, the chief scout said in a statement, I want to extend my sincere apologies to those in our scouting family who were offended by the political rhetoric that was inserted into the jamboree. That was never our intent. President speaking at the jamboree is a tradition. Spouting partisan politics while doing so is not. When the inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls was launched last September, it was always going to be emotional for families who've lost loved ones, but the process itself has become a target of anger and frustration, and today that boiled over. Bonnie Allen has the details. 
months of criticism has led to this, a vote of confidence and for some, the lack thereof. Our commissioners must be replaced. The Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs put forward a resolution that calls on the Prime Minister to restructure the inquiry and replace its commissioners. I think it's the commissioners because they admitted themselves that when they started they didn't know what they were doing and, and we've allowed them to flounder for, for such a long time. But a divide among chiefs and families became clear at today's national meeting. Things are flawed, but we can fix it. Last night, an unprecedented opportunity for hundreds of Indigenous leaders and some families of the murdered and missing to go face to face with two of the four remaining National Inquiry Commissioners. I was anxious for this moment because we were too silent. We were too silent. And that needs to stop. Michelle Odette was prepared to feel the brunt of their frustrations. You failed in communications. You failed to build trust. You failed to build relationships with families. There's broken hearts, broken spirits, because nobody's listening. Some say the inquiry was doomed to fail, that it doesn't put families first, and that it wasn't designed with Indigenous principles in mind. The commissioners explained that they are restricted by a lot of bureaucracy in different provinces and territories. For example, they can find police misconduct in Ontario, but not in BC. Hilda anderson Piers leads a coalition of families of the missing and murdered. I ask the commissioners to respectively step down. We're not stepping down. Simple as that. We have work to do, we have very important work to do, and we intend to do it. But it turns out the commissioners do have support here too. That inquiry is occupied by indig Indigenous commissioners and I don't think we should be calling on the federal government to fix it. In the end, Indigenous leaders voted against replacing the commissioners. It is clear from the vote, the majority, 60% is not, in, more than 60% is not in favour. But they did vote to order a reset to tweak the mandate to give the inquiry more power, but also to make it more culturally sensitive. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Contrasting stories tonight for communities coping with BC's wildfires. An evacuation order issued yesterday for Monty Lake is still in place. About 60 homes there are under threat. BC wildfire services are on location with multiple air tankers, but it's not known if any properties have sustained damage. To the northwest, after nearly two weeks away, thousands of residents from Williams Lake have gotten confirmation they can return home. But it's not quite an all clear. Aaron Collins explains. Signs that Williams Lake is coming back to life are everywhere along Highway 97. Growing optimism that this city could soon be back to normal. You know what, it's been like a ghost town, right? And you know, I think when, when the people empty out, it's like the soul of the community is gone. By noon, there was word that rumors of a return were true. Welcome home and please be as orderly in your return as you were during the evacuation. Thank you and I couldn't be happier. Like the fires that forced this evacuation, the news spread quickly and with it a growing line to get back home. First one through. How's that feel? <laughs> Feels good. Got a little crowd with uh, two rabbits, two dogs, two cats, and four people. For many, after a dozen days of worry, this is an emotional time. Yeah. I'm just really happy. This journey filled with relief. At the end of this drive, a house still standing and a sister waiting. And it's so exciting to see just the house, to see that I have to cut the grass and, and just all my good things here for sure. Get my animals back home and everything. Maddie Hordjuk was able to return home early to help prepare this community to reopen. That's exciting. Yeah, I've yeah. seen her face a lot of times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no lives or homes were lost in Williams Lake to the flames that crept down the hills around it. Although officials warned that this wildfire season isn't over yet. So we're saying you can come home. We also think if you're comfortable where you are, you can stay where you are, you might want to pause a little bit longer to make sure things settle down. An evacuation alert remains in effect here and officials warn the fires that threatened this community could yet return, forcing those people who returned home today to leave again. 
Aaron Collins, CBC News, Williams Lake, British Columbia. To last spring's wildfire in Fort McMurray, the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo has released its evaluation of the response from local authorities. The report found communication about the fire's risk and proximity to be undermined by mixed messages early on. In all, there were 14 recommendations, including refreshing emergency plans every year, implementing a united command structure to mitigate confusion, and starting recovery as soon as possible. Moving forward, the government of Alberta and the Red Cross will be combining efforts to apply $14 million to update fire safety protocols set to start this year. Coming up, communities rally around victims of terrorism, but when it comes to business owners, they're on their own. Susan Ormiston gets into the growth of terrorism insurance. Plus, I still see it too much. I feel it too much, and I hear about it too much. Wounds of a different kind faced by Canada's first female Indigenous surgeon. Well, if you've ever been prescribed antibiotics, you probably got the advice to take all the pills. That's what doctors and pharmacists have been telling patients for decades. But as health reporter Vic Adopia tells us, new research is calling that advice into question. It's prescription drug advice as old as the drug itself. Take the full course of antibiotics, yeah, always. If, if you don't, you're in trouble. I remember them saying you have to take the whole thing, even if you're feeling better. Typically, they say you should do the whole course for the entire week and not stop. But a top British medical journal has declared that medical orthodoxy has had its day. It's really got in, embedded in everybody's psyche, and people all think it's true. And it turns out there's been no further research on this properly ever since Alexander Fleming made his comment. That comment came from the father of antibiotics, Alexander Fleming. He warned cutting the course of treatment short would lead to antibiotic resistance, a warning that persists at Health Canada and the World Health Organization. But the world's top health body quietly changed its advice this month, now saying shorter treatments may reduce the speed by which the pathogen develops resistance. Still, has the antibiotic course really had its day? It's a headline. Uh, I don't think the antibiotic course has had its day. I think the antibiotic course over time is getting shorter and shorter, and that's a good thing. This infectious disease specialist says it's not so black and white. He advises doctors on how to limit overprescribing, but he says it shouldn't be left up to the patient. One of the challenges is that many physicians aren't aware of the most up-to-date evidence where shorter durations are as um, efficacious as the longer durations. Even the authors of the paper acknowledge it's going to be hard to change the conventional thinking surrounding antibiotics without clear evidence-based guidelines on the minimum course needed. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Earlier, I spoke about this with Dr. Michael Gardam of the University Health Network here in Toronto. He's a clinical researcher specializing in infectious diseases, and he joined me here in studio. You know, I've got to say, it, it strikes me, and I think a lot of people, that medical advice on things like this changes over time. And yeah. you hear one thing, then you hear another thing, and gosh, what do you do? What, what weight do you attach to this? I mean, I think there is a fair amount of weight here. I think the bigger question is, is what do we, what do, we do with it? I mean, we've known for a long time that when you expose bacteria to antibiotics, they can develop resistance to it. So the concept of giving shorter courses makes sense. I think the challenge is, is there's a lot of uh, different diseases where we don't exactly know how long we're supposed to treat them for. And so it is a bit dangerous, I think, for people to hear this message and then say, oh, I'm not going to complete my antibiotics. There's some infections where we know exactly how long we should be treating you when you actually can't uh, cut short. But in other cases, though, there, you may very well be able to shorten the course of antibiotics. Well, so what should people do? Like ask more questions of their doctor or like you don't want to be self-prescribing yeah. or cutting off willy-nilly, right? You know, I'm, I'm a big believer that working with your physician should be a dialogue, not a monologue. I think that if people have questions, they should be asking questions. They should be asking, you know, do I need to take this for 14 days? Can I take it for a shorter period? I mean, over the course of my, of, 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 of my uh, training, We've definitely seen courses of antibiotics we would have given three weeks 
uh, 20 years ago. Now we're down to five or six days. So as literature comes out and as evidence comes out, we're definitely shorting, shortening the courses of our antibiotics. And just quickly, the bottom line here seems to be from your perspective, one study, but this is an important one, right? There's a lot of literature from the lab backing this up. I think the key thing here is this is a message more for the doctors than it is for the public. The doctors need to think about how long they're giving antibiotics for. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. A fatal crash involving several transport trucks shut down a stretch of Ontario Highway today. The five-vehicle collision happened about 80 kilometers north of Toronto along Highway 48, just south of Sutton. Yeah, the collision damage of these involved vehicles is absolutely devastating. Uh, commercial vehicles and passenger vehicles are absolutely uh, crushed uh, beyond recognition. Two people were pronounced dead at the scene. Two others, including a child, were airlifted to hospital in critical condition. A popular midway ride is being pulled from fares across Canada after a deadly malfunction in Columbus, Ohio. One man died and seven people were injured after the ride broke apart in midair. This is what being on the fireball normally looks like from the rider's point of view. The main carriage spins while swinging up and down on a giant arm. But yesterday, the one at Ohio State Fair failed horrifically. This is the moment just before a whole seat section snapped off, slamming into the ground. The ride had passed inspection before the incident. Ohio Governor John Kasich has ordered a thorough investigation. As for fireball rides in Canada, they've been cancelled at fairs in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and at the CNE in Toronto. Almost a decade after arriving in Canada, four Tamil migrants can move on with their lives tonight. They arrived in Canada back in 2009, along with dozens of others aboard a rusting cargo ship from Sri Lanka, only to be arrested and charged with human smuggling. And today, after years of delay, a B.C. Supreme Court judge finally ruled on their case. Not guilty. Stephanie Mercier has more. Yeah, I am unable to explain my happiness. Because the relief is obvious on the face of Jayachandran Kanagaraja. He was one of 76 Tamil migrants who fled civil war in Sri Lanka on board the MV Ocean Lady in 2009. It arrived off the west coast of Vancouver Island that October. The passengers were detained, and he and three other men were later charged with human smuggling. Before their trial could begin, the courts spent years sorting out whether the laws they were charged under were too broad. Eventually, the Supreme Court of Canada concluded there could be three main defenses to human smuggling, including the one a judge found was used successfully in this case. One of the defenses to human, traffic, uh, human smuggling and trafficking is mutual assistance. And he said in this case there was uh, no evidence that they did not act anything but mutually to assist other asylum seekers and themselves coming to Canada. His client, who now lives and works in Toronto, has spent eight years waiting for this decision. And he's hoping to move on with his life, but the Crown can still appeal. We do not have life that end, so they won't say that. So every day, every single day, we were thinking about our future, how it is going to be. He's also hoping to win his next legal battle, proceeding with his refugee claim. Stephanie Mercier, CBC News, Vancouver. A Saskatchewan man has been charged with two counts of attempted murder. He's accused of driving a bulldozer through his son's home. This is all that's left of the house in Calder near the Manitoba border. Two adults were still inside at the time, but they were able to get out uninjured. 59-year-old Ronald Fatiker faces a total of 12 charges. Dude, let's go. Seriously. I'm not leaving. You're leaving the store. An indigenous Regina man says he was assaulted by a Canadian tire employee. Kameo Capo says he was at the store to buy a saw, but was confronted and asked to leave. Police are investigating the incident, and the retailer has apologized. Straight ahead, they have the badge, but the law doesn't back them up. The limits faced by Canada's military police. Since he dropped out of school seven years ago, he's devoted all his energies to comedy, working Canadian nightclubs, often for free, polishing his act, preparing for the big time. 
Now the recognition is starting to come. Ross Miller prepared this profile of the young man whose career as a comic is taking off. Let me know after the show, okay? Or you can phone It's going to be my first step to start him. Aiming Big for winner. the top, Provided he's played a struggling comic on a CBC drama, drawing big laughs with his plasticine face. You'll have to wait till next year. <laughs> he has won bouquets of praise as MC girls. of the Actra Awards and mimicked his host face to face on the Alan Thick show. Todd's gonna come up here and stick around, and Gloria Loring's gonna be coming up here and sticking around, so stick around. All the attention is the result of Jim Carrey's comedy act, an act that makes this 21 year old from Jackson's Point, Ontario one of the hottest new prospects on the nightclub stage. Jim's uh, show may seem like spontaneous slapstick, the kind of rollicking fun close friends have at a party, but it's all based on constant work. In front of the ever-present mirror, Jim warms up like a gymnast. The energy switches on, and the face and body go into a series of rubbery contortions, a cartoon show with a cast of 110 characters. At the prestigious comedy store in Los Angeles, he's been receiving standing ovations. There are now offers for movies and television roles. And of course, there's money. At this nightclub alone, Jim will earn $10,000 for one week's work. Two shows a night, seven nights a week, Jim virtually lives in nightclubs. That's why it's such a weird job, you know, people say, well, well, it, it, it mustn't be that hard just getting up, making people laugh. You just get up there, you're up there for an hour, and you're off for the night, you know? <laughs> because the, the thing is, it's like being a doctor. You're on call all the time. You know, it, you're always thinking about it, and you go to bed with it on your mind, and you're thinking, you're thinking of you on the Carson Show panel, you know? You're thinking of uh, things like that are going through your head all the time, you know? So you never really get rid of it. You just sort of uh, add everything else to it, you know. Well, when it comes to law enforcement on Canadian military bases, the military's own police officers face some significant limitations. Specifically, certain provincial mental health laws fall outside their authority. There are now calls to change that. But as the CBC's Murray Brewster reports, there are also mixed feelings about how much power they should get. Association, we're doing a ride check stop program. How are you doing? Cooperation between military and local police. You see it all the time. Problem is, they're not on equal ground when it comes to enforcing provincial legislation. Everything from mental health statutes to traffic stops. For example, local police can issue roadside suspensions if impaired driving is suspected, but not military cops. We can't issue that 24-hour suspension. We need to rely on one of our civilian uh, brothers and sisters in law enforcement to come in and enforce that. The reason is military police are not recognized as peace officers by provinces. The question of their jurisdiction is stark in light of the rise of mental health issues in the forces. In certain parts of this country, when military police are confronted by a suicidal soldier or family member who is uncooperative, they are required to call local police to the base to escort that person to hospital. It's happened 10 times in Western Canada since January 2016, and DND is looking at what to do. It is frustrating for them to have to rely on other agencies to do something that they see very clearly uh, within their abilities, uh, within their training to do. It's very complicated and I think there would need to be a lot of thoughtful consideration before there were any change to the existing uh, structure. I come at it from a, obviously a very emotional point of view. Military police training and accountability are two things close to the heart of Sheila Fines. Her son, Corporal Stuart Langridge, committed suicide. Sheila Fines and her husband Sean fought a long battle, including a public inquiry, to hold military police accountable for the botched investigation into her son's death. The Fines have mixed feelings here. Maybe they do need to have the authority, but with that comes um, a clear understanding of when that authority is to be used. There are critical questions all sides need to answer before any legislative changes. How much, if any, authority would military police have over civilians? 
who would conduct oversight in the case of misconduct and would their jurisdiction extend off military property? Perhaps most importantly, will the general public go for that? Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. Thousands of Palestinians returned to pray at the Al-Aqsa Temple Mount compound in Jerusalem today after Israel removed recently installed metal detectors and security cameras. But instead of a return to relative peace, there was violence. More than 100 Palestinians were injured in clashes with Israeli security forces at the site that is holy to both Muslims and Jews. This follows almost two weeks of protests and violence in Jerusalem and across the region. Israel had installed the security devices after two soldiers were shot to death this month. A freak storm rained chaos on Turkey's largest city today. Sheets of heavy rain washed out roads, submerged cars and trucks, and even brought down trees in Istanbul. While strong winds and hail the size of golf balls closed down the airport for a time. It was the second powerful storm to hit the city this month. The security situation in Venezuela continues to unravel after weeks of political violence. Tonight, the U.S. State Department ordered family members of government employees to leave and told workers they're free to go too if they want to. But getting in or out of the country becomes harder by the day. Colombia's flagship airline is just the latest carrier to announce it will stop flying to Venezuela next month, leaving hundreds of people in travel limbo. Air Canada, Lufthansa and United have already pulled out over concerns about the country's crumbling security. And a wild ride ended with an arrest after a long chase through the streets of Houston. A family was out for a drive a few nights ago when they spotted this white Mustang driving erratically all over the road, running red lights. So they trailed the driver into a parking lot and put him under citizen's arrest until police arrived. As they say, you don't mess with Texas. No kidding. Lots more to come on The National, including an interview both inspiring and brutally honest. You know, those stupid Indians, those First Nations, you know, their graduation rate, they can't even get out of high school. They can't say that kind of stuff because I'm protected by these sort of Western measures of success. Candid but words from it. Canada's first female Indigenous surgeon. But first, covering costs in troubled times, the rise of terrorism insurance. That's next on The National. We've got the day's business numbers. The TSX gained 19 points. The Canadian dollar fell a tenth of a cent. In New York, the Dow hit a record high. It was up 85 points. The price of oil rose 29 cents a barrel. One night last week, a baby was born in Britain, a little girl. Her birth has created controversy all around the world because she was conceived in a test tube. It gives hope to thousands of childless couples. It has also raised serious ethical questions about interfering with nature. To many doctors, the birth is simply a natural development of modern medicine. But there are those who say that doctors are defying God. I'm not in favor of it. I am very worried that she might grow up to be abnormal. Science seems to be a thing of the future. We have to live for the science, and it looks like our future is going to be di dictated by the science. Will they start also um, make their own race type of thing, like taking genes and things from certain people and, and saying we want this type of person, we want an intelligent person, we want them to look like this? Here, making her first guest appearance on television is Baby Louise and her parents, John and Leslie Brown. This is certainly a very happy story. Louise is a beautiful baby. But I know there has been criticism. Does this bother
And if we don't want the terrorists to win, we've got to make sure they don't impact and stop us doing what we do as a society. Terrorism tears at the social fabric, ripping lives away, leaving behind tangled threads of pain and fear. It also disrupts business as usual, and that changes lives in different ways. Susan Ormiston explores the impact on business owners because acts of God and acts of monsters have one thing in It's <laughs> a good intro. And if we don't want the terrorists to win, we've got to make sure they don't impact and stop us doing what we do as a society. And if we don't want the terrorists to win, we've got to make sure they don't impact and stop us doing what we do as a society. And if we don't want the terrorists to win, we've got to make sure they don't impact and stop us doing what we do as a society. Terrorism tears at the social fabric, ripping lives away, leaving behind tangled threads of pain and fear. It also disrupts business as usual, and that changes lives in different ways. Susan Ormiston explores the impact on business owners because acts of God and acts of monsters have one thing in common. Usually, they're not covered by insurance. What about let's get together and feel right. In a testament to resilience, London's borough market is buzzing. A foodie shrine still attracting thousands of Londoners and tourists daily. You'd scarcely know that two months ago there was complete mayhem. Three men running in and out of bars and restaurants, stabbing. They'd already rammed a vehicle into people on London Bridge. I was totally panicked, yeah. I mean, it was just, it was just terrifying. No, I mean, this is my community, these are my friends. So, yeah, it was incredibly, incredibly scary. This is wild venison from Scotland. Sean Cannon runs a charcuterie business, retail and wholesale. It's such a nice sausage, isn't it? Do you like a taste? The terrorist attack and crime scene investigation shut down his operations for a full 10 days. We couldn't get anywhere near my business. So I've got my market store, but I also have my warehouse here and my office. All the cash from the week before was in the safe. Couldn't come near it. About £20,000 worth of stock. Um, but, you know, because we supply restaurants, so it's, it's volume and it was just all sat there going out of date. The entire market was cordoned off, loss and damage estimated at more than a million pounds. Many small business owners had insurance, but not for this. As with all of the other businesses around here, the insurers have pretty much just shut the door on us, uh, saying that they won't even look at it because it's terrorism and therefore we're not covered. When vendors assessed the loss, the bars which had property damage would have a claim, but for the others who lost revenues, it would be a fight. Because it's terrorism, traditionally since 2001, the attack on the World Trade Center, insurers all put the clause in, either terrorism or acts of God, i.e. the weather, no coverage. 
the nature of terrorism is changing so fast that insurers, they're not keeping up with it. 9-11 was so big and so costly, the insurance industry backed off covering future losses from terrorism, adding exclusions to their policies. Businesses could purchase extra terrorism insurance, but it's limited and costly. But the terror threat has changed. Here at a London market, on a bridge or a boardwalk, the attacks are not so much about blowing up big buildings with lots of damage. They're about urban carnage. Crowded places where businesses have little or no protection against economic loss. Insurers admit there is now what's called a coverage gap. In fact, at nine o'clock on Sunday night, there was still a cordon just uh, around here, which meant that I had to close the office on the Monday morning. Julian Inoitsi is CEO of Britain's Pool Reinsurance, whose headquarters are just within hundreds of metres of the London Bridge attack. Poolry was set up in the wake of IRA bombings in the early 1990s. The British government backed a reinsurer to underwrite major terrorism insurance in Britain. If you think about um, 1993, which was when we were formed, uh, the, the, the terrorism modus operandi, in a sense, was to blow up buildings and try and cause damage to the economy. Since that time, everything has changed. Large-scale economic damage is now actually hurting the small businessman much more than it's hurting the big corporation as it was back in 1993. Poolry recognizes there is a gap that insurers need to offer more coverage for business loss due to terrorism, even where there's no property damage. That is a clear gap that we need to close and we are in discussions with the government, we're working with the government to say this is something that needs to be done. When the market reopened, there was a real sense of reclaiming. It was quite emotional when they, they rang the bell for the start of the day and some of the traders were in tears. I mean, they Borough Market is part of MP Neil Coyle's constituency. He's been working with the traders, the government and insurers to try to get compensation. If those businesses go under or people lose their jobs in those businesses, that was part of the attack. That's part of you know the terror they wish to impose on people is to not go back or to lose those businesses. Sean Cannon used pressure, politics and perseverance to get his insurer to finally agree to review his claim. In future, he says he would be willing to pay a slightly higher premium for coverage due to terrorism, but currently that's not on offer. We're not large businesses with pots of cash that can, you know, it's, it's every day. You've got to be out there trading. And if we don't want the terrorists to win, we've got to make sure they don't impact and stop us doing what we do as a society. Sadly, the threat is still constant, so that in Britain and elsewhere, small businesses will need greater protection from modern terror. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, London. Right after the break, Canada's first female Indigenous surgeon opens up about racism and healing.
This is the story of building the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Between Jasper and Red Pass, a start is made. All the latest... When you wear your white coat, people don't say racist things up to, right to your face because I'm protected by these sort of Western measures of success. But I hear it. Canada's first female Indigenous surgeon has experienced a lot on the job. She's connected with patients falling through the cracks of the healthcare system and given care that has earned her a top-notch reputation. But She's also experienced racism. She hears about it from her patients, and she's heard offensive remarks from other doctors. This is an excerpt of Nadine Caron's interview with Peter Mansbridge that originally aired last December. Take a look at this scene, because something special is happening here. It's the scrub room at a hospital in Prince George, British Columbia. All looks routine until you hear about the doctor scrubbing in. Are you guys ready for us to start? That's Dr. Nadine Caron, and she is Canada's first female Indigenous surgeon. Can I have a flower, please? She's in constant demand at the hospital by her patients, at home by her 10-year-old daughter, <laughs> and at medical conferences across the country where she's trying to change the way we treat Indigenous people. The patient is the expert. Everything down to their cultural history and their cultural background and where they reflect from. Every day she sees the impact that racism has on her patients and on her as their doctor. Caron is also a professor at UBC in Vancouver. She often drops by the Museum of Anthropology. It's where we met. One of the areas that you've been fairly outspoken on is the issue of racism within the healthcare system, which is a difficult discussion um, and I'm sure at times a painful one for you at times caught in the middle on this. Give me a sense of an example for you of how you've seen racism within the system when it comes to the patient care that's delivered for uh, First Nations or Indigenous peoples. An example, a patient walks into my office and then she's a First Nations lady that's traveled the distance. And I walk in and um, she, I ask her what nation she's from and she tells me and uh, I explain, oh, you know, I'm Anishinaabe, I'm from the other end of Canada. Um, and she starts to cry. She just breaks down crying. She's, I don't know, in her early 80s. And she says, I never thought I would ever, ever see and come to talk to an Indian doctor. Eight decades. She goes, you got to meet my grandkids. You, you got to talk to them. You got to come to my community. You got to tell them that this is possible. So there's that element of it where that you just see this relief, you know, sort of wash over her face. And what's it doing to you? It's amazing. It's an incredible honor. Um, it's an incredible responsibility. What is the racism in that story? Is it simply that this woman in her 80s 
had never been in a situation before where she was being dealt that's, with by an indigenous doctor. Yeah, and that's how it started. And then we started talking, and then I started realizing that a lot of the things that was on her sort of chart that had been sent to me by the referring physician, there was so much missing things that she hadn't done. And so she'd come to me for one reason, and we started talking about, okay, besides all that, you know, have you had a mammogram? because she, she, wouldn't, she didn't trust going into the medical system. But I had this opportunity to work with her to sort of say, okay, how can we take advantage of this safe space that we have right now to optimize the things that, that have sort of fallen off the wayside because of a level of distress. I still see it too much. I feel it too much and I hear about it too much. when you wear your white coat or you're a physician, people don't say racist things up to, right to your face.